What I'm going to be talking about is the relationship, as it says up there, between popular culture and political engagement. And what I'm trying to do, it's a kind of a bit of a whirlwind tour of, uh, of the relationship as I see it. Um, looking in part at the theory, I mean, how people think about that relationship, how they understand it sort of in, in, in kind of conceptual terms, but also uh, raising the question about how we might seek to demonstrate a connection between the consumption of popular culture and some form of political engagement. It's the, for me, I've become increasingly concerned about how it is that we might actually show that popular culture makes some kind of difference to uh, political thought and action. I should point out two things. One, that I'm going to talk almost exclusively about music. Actually, totally exclusively about music. Um, so I apologise, in a sense, for those who might expect a rather broader range of popular culture to feature. And the other thing that I will be doing is uh, kind of rushing through uh, my arguments, my ideas, and, and drawing on some of the research I've done. I suppose the reassurance there is that, you know, some, maybe if you're bored by what I'm saying at any one point, there's something that possibly more interesting might come along. Or at least if, it doesn't, if I don't say anything that's interesting, at least there's going to be a bit of music or a video clip that might temporarily distract you. What I was doing is I'm going to start with just a few illustrations. I think one of the things about talking about the relationship in particular of music to political engagement is that uh, one is never uh, uh, without a good example to, to draw upon. And my, my, uh, as I like to think of it, my good friend David Bowie uh, delivered exactly this last Wednesday night, uh, which if any of you are watching the Brits, uh, you will have heard Kate Moss uh, pleading on behalf of David Bowie for the Scots to stay stay with the rest of the United Kingdom, which caused, interestingly, quite a furore. Uh, I mean, it got a lot of press comment, but also some incredibly abusive remarks online uh, directed at, 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 his, uh, at Ziggy um, for his, uh, for his uh, presumption in having anything to say on this subject. And it's not altogether surprising. I mean, this is a man who's, as far as I'm aware, previous political engagement involved... Uh, summoning up the ghost of Adolf Hitler back in the 1970s and saying that that's what we needed, a bit of a, 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 a sort of strict hand. Um, so and he's not a man whose political credibility, I think, stands much, much examination. I mean, he's, he stands, I think, next to Sean Connery in terms of his relationship to independence and his uh, commitment to it. But anyway, this, I suspect, was uh, less familiar to, is less familiar to you, but actually earlier this month, I think it was about the 5th of February, 4th of February, um, it was National Registration Day, which was being promoted by the Electoral Reform Society. But what, what was interesting, as far as someone who's interested in the relationship between music and politics is concerned, is that uh, this campaign was being fronted by uh, musicians. And the idea was the Electoral Reform Society thought the way to reach young people, to get them to register to vote, was to have a few musicians uh, fronting up the campaign. I don't think it had a tremendously powerful effect. Earlier this last summer, there was an extraordinary news item which also caught my attention, which, is, which was the claim that, in some, in some sense, Bruce Springsteen had been responsible for the fall of the Berlin Wall. And, 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 and as you can see, well, this quote actually comes from when he did perform in East Berlin in 1989. So, you know, there's a coincidence there that you could push. But, but it was taken seriously, and there was a big piece in The Observer developing this idea that Bruce Springsteen had, in some way or other, contributed to the major 20th century political event, or one of the major political events, or at least of the late 20th century. Um, what it seems to me, what's going on, of course, in all of these claims is the focus on the musician, the actor in this story, is David Bowie, is Bruce Springsteen, is the musicians who are working on behalf of Bite the Ballot. The musician is the actor who is supposed to have made a difference to what we do. Uh, for me, that's okay, that's important, I'll come back to that, that thought that musicians are in some way or other influential actors in the modern world and ones to whom people pay attention. But actually, for me, there's another thing that I think is possibly more interesting in trying to think about this relationship between in this case, music and political action, which is the music, it, music itself. I'm going to play, show you a couple of uh, slides here accompanied by a bit of music. The point is the, the quote or the claim that, that accompanies them. The first is, uh, 
Curtis Mayfield in the Impressions. I mean, the point I want to make is, is, is in each of these slides, there is a quote, in this, in this case from a book by Ruth Felsing called How It Feels to be Free, in which she's talking about the sense of politics in motion happening as the music is being played, that hearing Nina Simone sing Mississippi Goddam is to hear politics in motion. And in the previous slide, uh, Andrew Young, a, a colleague of Martin Luther King, here making the claim that in some sense or other, music contained the spiritual power that is associated also with, with King. And the idea here is that it's, it's the music, not the musicians, who are making the difference. And that, part of what I'm trying to think through and talk about is the extent to which we could talk about that and how we might approach that idea that music is in itself an actor in the political world, and there is a way of, of demonstrating that. Part of the problem, of course, with both of these claims is they're largely a, an exercise in rhetoric. They're trying to persuade us of the possibility that music can be politics in motion, that it can have spiritual power. The question of whether it really does seems to me is uh, largely un, unsupported. There are, though, academic attempts to uh, provide evidence. There's a two-volume uh, collection on music and human rights, edited by Ian Petty, in which, as it were, it, it's pro in its kind of uh, five, six hundred pages, claiming to document the extent to which music has, in some way or other, promoted human rights across the world. And it's, and it's compendious in its reach, although I have to say totally unpersuasive in its arguments. And that's because, for the most part, the question of what human rights are, how music might actually contribute to them, is never fully explained. Compounded, too, by... I have to tell you this. I don't know. It's a, it's a, cheap, it's a cheap abuse. But I, was, I had to review these books. And I was, I was looking at it, and I was reading through it, and I was wondering why the, why the chapters came in the order they did. They didn't seem to have been themed in any obvious way. And then I realised they were in alphabetical order of authors. And I was thinking, what on earth possesses anybody who edits a book to think that putting it in the alphabetical order of authors, it seemed most, most odd. But it added to my misgivings about this thought that you, you can easily demonstrate this connection between, in this case, music and human rights. Nonetheless, it is something to which we often give attention. Here's another example. And one of the things that it, this example raises is this slightly, the, the, the ways in which music can be used even where you might actually not see an obvious or immediate connection. Actually, there is a connection here. But this is Gezir Square in, in Turkey. Those of you who are familiar with it, or, or fans of musicals will recognise Les Mis. Now, the, the point is that, in a sense, that's a kind of that odd juxtaposition of a song from Les Mis, which, of course, and its themes has something to do with the kind of protests of people. But, but the fact that it being sung in Turkey in 2013 by a choir who were demonstrating their their objections to the regime and so forth, is, I think, kind of interesting when we're thinking about, well, what is that music doing? What is the singing of that music doing uh, in terms of the, the political struggle in which those people are engaged? So it seems to me there's a lot of rhetoric, there's a lot of uh, examples of things that we might draw on in talking about this relationship between music and political engagement, but ones that need, I think, closer examination. I should, though, before I go any further, offer a counter view. Um, and it's this. Uh, forget, uh, forgive the, uh, the, 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 the forthright language in which it's expressed. But as you can see, this is a view which doesn't uh, share uh, the thought that music and politics deserve to be linked. I don't know if anyone would care to guess as to who this musician, that it's a musician who is uh, offering this particular uh, judgment. It sounds like Keith Richards. Liam Gallagher? Keith Richard. Keith Richard. No, no, both excellent guesses. Actually, it's, it's Mike Skinner of the streets, but I mean, it could have been any of them, I, I must say. And it's, 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 a, it's a view that I think we need to hold in our heads as this goes on, that this thought that what is it is that musicians or songs might contribute to anybody's political understanding is something that we, we should uh, cross-examine at least. Now, what I want to do in the rest is just to talk about the different ways in which one might approach this question of how it is that music and musical uh, uh, plays into forms of political engagement. And, and that, one way of starting is to look at, as it were, the autobiographical, at how people 
recount their own lives in terms of music and how they use music or talk about music as a way of comprehending and engaging in politics. I'll just flip quickly through the examples that I have. The first, this comes from uh, 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 some research by George Mackay on jazz musician, uh, jazz fans in the 1950s. Trad jazz musicians in, uh, uh, music fans in Britain. And this quotation here uh, is, and I, by the way, I'm happy to send my slides to anyone who, who's interested in, if they haven't time to read or if they, they want to pursue things further. But in this, in this quotation, the, the fan is telling George Mackay about how their love of, of trad jazz and in particular music that came from the United States caused them to become, un, un, uh, give them an understanding, a comprehension, a, a fellow feeling for those engaged in the civil rights movement. In other words, there was, there's a story about coming to understand uh, the lives and experiences of others through the consumption of music. And that obviously is, in a sense, one of the ideas that I want to return to at the end about how it is we might engage with music politically and how it, uh, it might affect us. And this was a relative, and this is a, a person whose, whose name is not recorded in, in the research. This is someone who does record their name. It's Billy Bragg. And Billy Bragg here, in his book, it's a sort of autobiography, writing about how the clash uh, led him into politics, how following the clash led him into engaging with the anti-Nazi league and rock against racism, how the clash, in a sense, were part of his political education. And he was able then to kind of comprehend and understand what his idea of politics might be. Here's another musician, also referring to their political education and its relationship to music. It's Tracy Thorne of Everything But The Girl in her wonderful autobiography bedsit Disco Queen, in which she talks about how it was almost an automatic response to her musical tastes and the musical fashions of her time to, to adopt a, a left-wing position, that it almost came through the politics as, a, as a, matter of, a matter of course. And it seems to me that there's something going on here that is worth at least acknowledging this idea that people have of, that their own autobiographies, their own experience of life has in some sense been a, uh, a product of their musical tastes and their musical tastes have in some sense informed uh, a set of political values to which they have then subscribed. What I'm not so sure about, and I've got, you know, it might scare in my mind, of course, how generalizable this claim is. And the other thing that is clearly obvious about these claims, at least in the case of Bragg, and Tracy Thorne, that they both locate themselves in the 1970s, the era of punk and everything associated with it. And that, too, I think, may be significant when we are thinking about the potential generalizability. But, of course, this idea of the relationship between uh, music and political engagement and the 1970s connects uh, often in people's minds with the subcultural theory that comes from Birmingham and the Centre for Contemporary Cultural Studies and, of course, the late Stuart Hall. And that thought that in some way or other there are real and substantial reasons for supposing a relationship between uh, a, a political resistance and, and uh, popular music. Well, I don't want to talk so much about 1970s and Stuart Hall and subcultural theory, although I think it's important. What I want to do is talk about this lot. Okay, so we have three women performing a song in a cathedral in Moscow almost exactly two years ago, 21st February 2012. And then we have these stories appearing in the British newspapers in the months after that performance and the trial of those three women and their subsequent imprisonment and their recent release, in the case of two of them, the earlier release of the third and what's extraordinary, I think, is thinking about what, it, what is being said. Here's the Financial Times, the Guardian, the Daily Telegraph, all talking about Pussy Riot in terms of some kind of major political intervention. Very different. If you look at the pages of the Daily Mirror in the days after the Sex Pistols appear on the Bill Grundy show, The Filth and the Fury was their headline. And the whole idea was to dismiss out of hand punk as any kind of significance, it's something that we should be, an excrescence, you know, that should be uh, drummed out of town, as it were. A very different kind of story 30, 40 years later, 
when we, uh, when we have Pussy Riot. And, and it is that's the, the nature of the claim that's been made for this uh, group of musicians, or would-be musicians, performing in a cathedral for two, two minutes max. And the thought that in some ways or other, empires were shaking uh, as a consequence of that performance is, is quite an extraordinary set of claims. Uh, a set of claims that are then uh, reinforced by other commentators like Madonna and Zizek and Suzanne Moore and Griel Marcus, these kind of the, the commentators of de nos jours, the people whose voices are given credibility and authority when talking about popular culture and its, and its responsibility and its power, all investing Pussy Riot with this extraordinary impact, significance, courage, etc., shaking, as I say, uh, Putin's uh, authority and challenging... Um, uh, 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 an empire or apparent empire. And uh, in a sense, that's, uh, that was in, uh, and is, to some extent, still the story uh, as we read it. I think, though, it's worth pausing to actually uh, reflect upon other dimensions to, to the Pussy Riot story. Um, one of the things that it happened as a consequence of, of, of Pussy Riot was actually this gave... Um, Putin a very easy target for him to reinsert, uh, reassert his authority. It didn't actually, in that sense, weaken him to the same extent as it might have been seen to do, or in which the commentators in the West wanted it to be. That in many senses, it promoted an already uh, emerging coalition between the Orthodox Church in, in Russia and Putin's uh, political regime. And there's a very, very interesting piece by a guy called Nicholas Tosha in, the, in, um, in Popular Music in which he says that we, we, in the West in particular, are fundamentally misunderstanding Pussy, Pussy Riot precisely because what we do is we rewrite them into a, 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 a kind of Cold War scenario. And they are the voice of freedom. They are the voice of liberty. They are refighting the Cold War on our behalf. And that as a result, we have completely misunderstood the politics that Pussy Riot set in train and what they uh, actually can be seen to represent for the power of possibilities of music and its relationship to, to politics. Um, I don't want to add much more, although I, I mean I do think it's really in, that important to, to reflect a bit on what uh, Pussy Riot are doing and, and how we might, as it were, deconstruct or, or, or understand what, what's going on there. Um, I mean, it is clear that they are very much like the way people wrote about punk in the 1970s, drawing upon art theory of Duchamp and the Surrealists and Dadaists and so forth, that Voyner, which is the kind of the political art movement uh, out of which Pussy Riot come, have engaged in these kind of situationist tactics which uh, were associated with, with the traditions that also informed punk in the 70s. Um, that that you know that inheritance still goes on. That it's in the, in the recent book by Martha Gesson on Pussy Riot. She talks about how the, the the women in the band listen to the Cockney Rejects in order to get their inspiration for punk. Uh, a set, you know the set of classic seventies punk band, and then the Riot Girls uh, genre represented by Bikini Kill. These were they were explicitly and deliberately appearing to draw upon punk in order to articulate their their political opposition to the, uh, to the Putin regime. What is also interesting is, of course, how carefully constructed the event was. Although that video appears to be taking place in that Moscow cathedral in which uh, they are, and where, where they are actually arrested, but in fact, the film that we see up on YouTube was filmed elsewhere. It was filmed in advance of the event because they didn't think they were going to be able to, to, to put it together on the, on, the, on the occasion. So they filmed it in another cathedral where nobody was noticing, and then, then uh, you know, edited it in such a way as to make it look as if it was the event itself. And in other words, it's a heavily and carefully crafted artwork that we're, we're, we're dealing with. And at the same time, I think it's, it's important to understand where it, who's it, who it plays to. Uh, recent sort of evidence, Washington Post and other... Uh, research in, 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 in Russia has indicated that you know, this, is, this plays to an urban, youthful elite. But you know, if you look at the larger population in Russia, they mostly disdain Pussy Riot. They, are very, uh, they, were, they, they want to see a, a firmer uh, sentence uh, doled out to them. And 
that uh, for the most part, the things like the Orthodox Church is, is growing in the support it, 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 it receives. So, you know, Pussy Riot's actual political contributions are not obviously of the kind that we might otherwise have thought. But it does seem to me what they did do in terms of thinking about this relationship is put a challenge to us about how we should write and think about these kinds of uh, uh, events and the relationship between music and politics. And in a sense, it's, it drove me back to thinking about the historical uh, narratives that have been constructed by people like E.B. Thompson in the 1960s in the making of the English working class, and more recently by James Scott in his uh, wonderful book on domination and the arts of resistance, in which he, like Thompson, explores the ways in which popular uh, resistance was organised and, ar uh, and articulated through music, and particularly through hymns. Um, I came across these um, one quote from, from Scott himself, talking about slaves being imprisoned for singing uh, particular hymns. And at the bo above that, David Horn in the Encyclopedia of, of World Popular Music, writing about uh, the use of the hymn and the hymnal, historically, both as a model for the popular song, but also as a vehicle of resistance, which is exactly what E.B. E. Thompson identifies in the making of the English working class, about how hymns functioned as, as part of a mode of resistance that could give some kind of voice to, to, to oppression, to opposition to oppression. And it seems to me that kind of thought about how we should, as it were, uh, research this problem uh, and the way we might write about it is illustrated by this historical approach. And it's a, a problem with which I'm currently wrestling. I won't detain you for long, but I have got a grant with a colleague from Reading University to look at the history of, of punk in Britain in 1975 to 85 in terms of its politics. And... Um, one of the wonderful things about being at UEA was the UEA was the place where the Sex Pistols were due to play in 1976 before they turned up on Grundy's show and everybody banned them. And uh, UEA was the first place to ban them. This is a ticket to go to the UEA gig that never happens. And uh, I have discovered uh, recently that there are a whole bunch of people who were at UEA in 1976 who were desperate desperate to talk about what it was like then. But the point, of course, is, is what we're trying to do with this project is trying to reconstruct the experience of punk as it emerged. It's almost trying to tell history without knowing what happens afterwards, without knowing what's going to happen next. Um, and it's not easy enough, and these interviews are actually not very useful precisely because they're all hindsight, they're all looking, looking back. The other thing that writing history doesn't give you is the kind of theoretical framework or at least not this kind of history, doesn't give you the kind of theoretical framework, which I think is also necessary, which is to try and see how does music play in to larger social movements? How does it operate as a vehicle for social change? Um, and that's why we and others obviously look to the kind of vast and growing literature, particularly focused around the civil rights movement and particularly around uh, African-American music in the United States, and the ways in which that has formed um, a, a mechanism by which social movements have engaged with their wider constituency, the way in which the logic of collective action, which tells people actually there's no point in participating because you'll benefit whether you do or not, music plays a very important part. And musicians, as kind of witnesses to the, to the claims, are part of a, 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 an effective mechanism for organising and, and mobilising social movements. And it seems to me that kind of theory is very important, at least the idea that we need such a theory. I'm unconvinced by much of this in the, to the extent, which I'll explain in a minute, they don't look at two things. And one of the things they don't look at is the extent to which the relationship between mu music and political movements has to take account of, as it were, the, the mundane politics of those events. And one of the things uh, we did at, at UEA was do some research which tried to compare different movements and their use of music and looking at why it is that some movements work effectively with music and some don't. We compare Rock Against Racism with Live 8, um, separated by 20-odd years and so on, but looking at the ways in which um, how music and, um, uh, needs to be organised in to political movements and how political movements can form networks around which musicians can operate. And that without that understanding, without the understanding of how musicians and political activists get together, you can't really account for events like Rock Against Racism. You can't even account for things like Live Aid. They actually depend on this kind of interplay, these networks that allow people like Bob Geldof actually to be able to call upon the favours that the musicians... But at the same time, 
get the support of people like the BBC, because if the BBC doesn't show Live Aid, it doesn't happen. It isn't an event. It isn't something that anybody's going to take any notice of. The same way with Rock Against Racism only worked because there were all these groups around the country organising themselves both as venues, but also there were various kind of political factions who were able to, to contribute. And this kind of process, it seems to me, is really important to understanding why these movements happen. But it's also about why the politicians who get involved in these things want to be part of it. This is, as it were, this is to, to go up to the elite level. But it just seems to me that's kind of interesting in thinking about the relationship between music and politics is the ways that elite political leaders, in this case Bill Clinton and Tony Blair, are themselves seduced by the power of popular music and how their own fandom plays into the political events that get acted out. These, are, these, are two quote, these two here are extracts from Alistair Campbell's diary, where he's talking about Tony Blair as a kind of uh, 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 enthusiastic fan um, and the ways in which that actually did shape the ways in which that uh, politician acted out his, his political obligations. But, of course, what I'm doing here is I'm going back into the role that musicians play uh, and moving away from the role that music plays. And that, too, is the thing that's missing from a lot of the accounts that are given about how the civil rights movements uh, have used music. There's not much on how the music itself plays into political action that is being described. And a lot of it works by hindsight, looking back and seeing these continue, uh, these uh, links between the music and what actually happened politically. And that's why we need, I think, sometimes to remind ourselves of the arguments of people like Benedict Anderson who talks specifically about how in imagining communities, singing together can, in a way, provide a sense of, of community that is being imagined. That the very act of singing is itself a mechanism by which we understand what it belong, means to belong to a nation. And in the work of someone like Jane Bennett, a kind of post-structuralist political theorist, who's looking at the ways in which our sensibilities are mobilised, such that we are willing to take political, political action. And it seems to me that these sorts of ideas, these ideas that, in a sense, music is actively contributing to political action, needs to be included in the account we give of how social movements take hold. A particular uh, writer on that, on that score is the writer Kevin MacDonald, in a book on global social movements, who argues that actually social movements are themselves kind of counter-rational activities, that resemble more the experience of listening to music. And he actually compares music, uh, movements to music, saying they're more like music than they are many of the other things which we typically understand them to, to represent or, or, or to involve. This is where I want to kind of... Uh, this is where things get a little more... Well, even, even more tendentious. And what I want to do in the rest of what I'm going to say is try and uh, explore, just push a little further on this idea of music as an active contributor to political action and how and what this might, might mean. Well, was, the, the, the public enemy explain what they're doing in their music in that video clip. But you have to wait quite a long time before you get to that bit. And what they suggest is the way their music works as two, two forms, two issues. One, is a, one of the public enemy explains the kind of music that public enemy, you know, kind of the leading kind of political hip-hop band, what they do is they first of all choose music that their girlfriends don't like. They deliberately choose music that alienates their, their women folk. And that itself is itself an indication of a, of a kind of politics that they are exploiting in, in constructing their music. And then they talk about having decided what this kind of, they're setting up this kind of gender politics. They then talk about how we deliberately, we deliberately make our music out of time. We deliberately make it out of tune. We deliberately create noise. And the idea of what they're trying to do there is explain that, that these kind of things are being out of time, being out of tune, being noisy, is what gives their music the power that it is seen to have. It isn't about uh, delivering a particular message in the kind of traditional sense of that word. And it's this, this sort of thought that um, you... Oh, sorry. You get in quotes like this from Max Roach, the drummer, in which he's claiming that rhythm 
rhythm is what conveys the message of the music. It's not the sentiments expressed in the lyrics. Of course, in jazz, that's not going to be the case anyway. The militancy is in the music. That's the thought. That's the idea. That's the rhetoric, I think, that is being appealed to and which Public Enemy and others are, are claiming ownership of. And here's another example, this time with some accompanying music. And you see, that again, I mean, in the quotation, which comes from Scott Saul's book on, on the civil rights movement and jazz, is, is his claim that form a political organisation that is appropriate to the, to the movement is also embodied in the music. And the music, in a sense, is pro providing a demonstration of that form of organisation. It's the music, in a sense, that's leading rather than the music, uh, the, the politics. I'm. Now, and this is the kind of last uh, section. What these sorts of arguments are trying to do, I think, is move us away from, me, move, those who want to think about this relationship between music and politics f away from, perversely, is the sense in which music is directly a product of its social conditions. That it is directly an expression of people's particular experiences. And I think... One of the things that's interesting, it typically, I mean, certainly I have always, tended to assume that music's political role comes in a sense as a result of, as a product of, the social and political experiences of those who make it, those who consume it, etc. That in an important sense, that it is, as uh, Thomas Theodore Gross, Graysek, whom I'm drawing here, calls the social relevance theory. That is the idea that music has its power because it's relevant to the experiences of those who are consuming it or making it, etc. And that, therefore, we, this is how we get to talk about taste or musical uh, values, etc., in terms of a certain set of social locations, that uh, people like Tia Denora talk about music as a mechanism of social regulation, and so on and so forth. It's all about locating music within uh, the social and making it, in some sense, relevant. Now... I think this is a very powerful idea, and it's one to which I think almost everybody to whom I've referred up until this point has been appealing. But it's not necessarily or quite what some of those autobiographical quotes were referring to, which I, 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 I drew your attention to at the, at the very beginning. And it seems to me that what Graysick is doing, together with a writer like Simon Frith, is asking us to think about what actually music is doing and whether we should think of music in these socially relevant terms. Is there some other way we ought to incorporate politics into music um, than through uh, its relevance and, and so forth, its place in a particular set of experiences? And in um, these two quote, well, these quotes, there is some semblance of that argument emerging. I mean... Uh, I'll come back to T Theodore Grasick, but in, in an article by, or chapter by Simon Frith, he asks, why, why do songs have words? It's a kind of obvious question, you might think. But he answers it by saying, well, actually, the words are really there just for the voice. And that words don't function like poems. They don't function like messages. They're not about social realism. They're plays. They are much more like a drama than they are like any other, uh, other literary form. And he talks about the fact that they make you feel the tune. This, the, the, the final quote there is from somebody we interviewed as part of another project I was involved in at UEA in which we were trying to explore how young people in particular felt music and other forms of popular culture played into their relationship to politics. And although I would be stretching uh, your credibility to claim that what we found in our interviews with people did in any sense fit with the kind of theory that I'm just advancing in the last bit of this talk, there were elements of it there. Uh, this is, uh, again, from those, those interviews we did with young people about what it was they were looking for in music, what it meant for them, uh, and how it might possibly link to, to politics. What it, often they're doing is making a contrast between why they won't listen to politicians and they will listen to, 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 to the, the songwriters and others that they like and they listen to. Um, it's, it's, it's about making you think and the way in which music makes you think. And this is about Coldplay and about how they uh, take Coldplay seriously because of who they are and how they, as it were, signify for them. Again, back to some of those autobiographical accounts that I gave you at the very beginning. 
Uh, and here's uh, Kanye West, who, is, uh, who featured quite prominently. We did these, these interviews quite a little while ago, and Kanye West is still very popular. But, but at the time, he was, he was extraordinarily popular with the people we were talking to. And here, again, they're talking about the ways in which the music plays into their understanding of the world and how they use them in order to make sense of their experiences of that world. And it, in a sense, it was, it was not by delivering messages. And it wasn't ever in relating it to their own particular social locations or circumstances that they did this. Uh, there, there was, in a sense, an, an aesthetic that they were trying to capture in, uh, in these interviews we did. They were trying to, to get, at, get at how we um, felt when we heard music and thinking about that as a, as a form of political expression. And that's, that's what Grasic is trying to do in his account, his rather wonderfully titled book, Listening to Popular Music, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Led Zeppelin. And in this, in this book, it's a very, I mean, he's a, he's a political philosopher, a philosopher anyway, um, who is really trying to tease out the space between this social relevance theory, the idea that music is a product of a particular set of experiences, and the idea of music as in some sense offering us an aesthetic realm in which we derive the true pleasures that it has to offer. And in that aesthetic pleasure, we actually come to understand its true powers, which is its powers to make us experience things that are our eyes closed off to us. Um, let me give you last, in a desperate attempt to persuade you that I might have even the vaguest idea what, uh, of something that's worth talking about, uh, play you just a couple of things. First of all, Leslie Gore singing You Don't Own Me from 1963. And let me play you this too. I recorded You Don't Own Me in 1964, for me to believe, but we're still fighting for the same things we were then. Yes, ladies, we've got to come together, get out there and vote, and protect our bodies. They're ours. Please vote. So, it, if the, in some ways, I think what that does, or that particular use of please, I mean, you don't own me, in part tries to capture what I think Grasick is getting at here in terms of the free play of imagination, the ability to create and understand communities beyond those of our immediate experience and the powerful effects it has, for me anyway. Um, but also, what he does too, Grasick, in making this case that the aesthetic needs to be preserved and protected and understood as part of where the politics of music really operate is to keep the two worlds separate as well. In other words, he, wants, he, he himself, Grasick, is worried that if we they end up thinking that all politics is nothing but aesthetics, is nothing but performance, we will, uh, as it were, essentially uh, play into the hands of the cynics who simply uh, exploit that uh, uh, to think that if you, if you create a political advertisement, you've somehow intervened in the political world. You haven't. It, it's when people vote that the difference gets made. But the thought that that ability of music to generate the spirit and thoughts that might uh, ultimately uh, be realised in the vote is important, is what music is doing. And it seems to me, I, I mean, I've been re really, I'm, I, mean, I don't pretend to fully understand the argument. I'm not entirely sure that I will end up agreeing with it. But it does seem to me, it's at least provoked me to think, well, all of those kind of easy assumptions I was making, all those easy arguments I was inclining to follow, needed to be reworked, even in claiming that music mattered. And um, that's, I hope, uh, at least given you something to argue with me about. But what I've tried to do, uh, as I say in this talk, is, is to think about how music shapes and, and uh, sorry, and mobilizes uh, political engagement. To look at those different approaches from the autobiographical, to which, as I say, I keep on finding myself coming back. Uh, to give more emphasis on the musicological in so far as I see Grasek is offering that, and um, to try and see what it means to keep, as it were, a preserve around the, the notion of the aesthetic in order to establish the possibilities of music having real power rather than simply reinforcing preconceptions and experiences that are already exist in the world, that it's the capacity to shape and create new ones that seem to be its source of power. Thank you for your amazing patience. I shall stop now. Thank you. Thank you.